Namaste and good evening. I, Mahima Kapoor, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nay Delhi, extend a warm welcome to you all to the IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have gathered for a special lecture on politicizing the pandemic impact on electoral democracy by Major General Anil Verma. This discussion is being organized by the Center for Human Dignity and Development at IMPRI. I'm honored to introduce our eminent speaker for today, Major General Anil Verma. In 1975, Sir joined the Indian Army and retired after 37 years of distinguished service. Currently, he is the head of the Association for Democratic Reforms, ADR, since December 2013 and oversees all administrative and operative activities of the Pan-India Organization. He frequently writes for English and Hindi newspapers and magazines on issues related to electoral and political reforms. He has represented ADR in several national and international events pertaining to democracy, electoral, and political reforms. From time to time, he is also invited to interact with foreign delegations on issues of governance and advocacy, transparency and accountability in electoral politics, citizen engagement through RTI, among other themes. On 25th January 2020, which is the National Voters Day, on behalf of ADR, Major General Vanma received the National CSO Award at the hands of the President of India, Sri Ram Nath Govind, and other election commissioners and in the presence of Chief Election Commissioner Sri Ravi Shankar Prasad for the voter awareness campaign conducted by ADR. He has a Bachelor's in Commerce, Master's in Defense Studies, and Master's in Political Science. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. Further, we are fortunate to have with us today Dr. Niranjan Sahu, Senior Research Fellow at Observer Research Foundation, ORF, the number one think tank in South Asia, New Delhi, and Mr. Shinivas Alavili, who is the head of Civic Participation, Janagra Center for Citizenship and Democracy, Bangalore, and co-founder of Citizens for Bangalore, as the discussants for the session. Welcome. Now, I invite Major General Verma for the special lecture, and we look forward to learning from his vast experience. Thank you. Thank you, Mahima. Okay, uh, I'll request Arjun to kindly show the PPT. Firstly, good evening, Namaskar, Jaihin to everyone. And I thank Dr. Arjun Kumar and the IMPRI for inviting me to speak on this important issue. Uh, though it has gone a little in the background now because the elections are over and a few months have passed. Uh, but uh, I'll try to cover the salient points uh, as shown on the next page on the contents. So this is our intent covering it. Basically, uh, you know, the role of the election commission and the political parties and what the impact was and uh, what are the summary of observations and what are our recommendations from ADR. Next, please. So uh, we are all aware that uh, COVID pandemic was uh, something, you know, which nobody knew how to handle. It was something new and devastating and uh, therefore it posed unprecedented challenges. And uh, there was a certain sense of, you know, radical uncertainty as to how to deal with it and how to go. So uh, holding the polls and the elections during this pandemic uh, meant immense responsibility and institutional susceptibility and proactiveness. Though uh, broad guidelines were formed by the election commission based on the suggestions from political parties and CEOs of the states and the union territories. And these guidelines were uh, promulgated to well in time before the elections to everyone. And uh, they also made certain uh, improvements in the system, like uh, the nomination process was made online. First time, the option of postal ballot voting 
for uh, people with disability categories and senior citizens about a certain age, I think it was 80 or something, um, they could do po uh, voting by postal ballots. Then uh, virtual rallies were encouraged, online political communication with expansive use of social media, etc., was encouraged. Next. So the basic, uh, there were two sets of elections. The first one was, of course, Bihar Assembly elections, 2020. Uh, this was uh, when the COVID pandemic was raging, I would say. So this was conducted in three phases. There were 72 million plus voters and there were 243 constituencies in the Bihar state. 876 cases of MCC violations were registered. 165 cases of violations of COVID rules were registered. And uh, just a sub note that Bihar has the lower number of isolation and ICU beds per million people in India. The next set of elections was recently held in 2021, as you're all aware. This was done in eight phases. 187 million plus voters, 824 assembly seats, more than 100 FIRs were registered in Bengal itself for COVID norms violations. 178 notices of violation for COVID rules to the political parties were issued. 67 notices to TMC, 59 to BJP, and others to the other main parties, Congress, CPIM, AIMM, and Rashtriya Secular Majlis Party. Uh, though what happens to these FIRs and these notices, we do not get to know subsequently because the details are not available on the Election Commission website. Uh, generally, through the media reports and otherwise, it was seen that each state and UT going to the polls registered high positivity rate and jump in fatalities. States with multiple phases, especially, for example, West Bengal and Assam, were badly affected. Uh, less spread in Kerala due to single phase. This is as per the Midnapur City College study, which I will be referring to a little later also. This was a study carried out uh, to uh, bring out the effect of elections during the pandemic. Next, please. So this Actually, picture I have selected just to show, you know, the expectation versus reality. Now, if you see on the left is the picture of a model polling booth, you know, where proper marking has been done and people are standing at the distance and thermal uh, temperature is being taken and everybody is wearing masks and all that. And uh, so uh, certain guidelines which the election commission had given uh, for the health, safety, uh, both for the personnel uh, who were manning the polling booths, who were conducting the election, and also for the voters were being followed. But at the same time, you will all recall that uh, to the media reports, you know, reporters from different channels were roaming around all over the states and reporting from different towns, cities, and urban areas and rural areas. And... Uh, the above arrangements which are shown in this picture were not really followed in all the other places. Then uh, reality, if you see the picture, we are all aware, uh, everything was on social media, the pictures, videos, etc., where, you know, thousands of people were attending the rallies and uh, all the parties were involved. All the leaders uh, were involved. And uh, the tragic part was, as reported by the media, more than 16, 21 teachers and support staff uh, passed away from COVID-19 during the poll duty in UP Panchayat election, which were held a couple of months back. Next, please. So uh, coming back to this uh, Midnapur City College and Indian Center for Space Physics findings, and this was conducted in June 21. The couple of highlights uh, which were confirmed was firstly that the political campaigns and election activities significantly impacted the corona virus spread in India. The second was that the study confirmed a significant rise in effective contact rate and effective reproduction numbers 
during the election bound period and immediately after if you see the infographic of uh, hindustan times there was a reporter who attended these separate rallies organized by bjp tmc and sayuk morcha in west bengal during the elections and you can see uh, he is nicely covered you know the various uh, safety measures which as per the guidelines of the election commission which were supposed to be followed how they were flouted all the parties i mean he has just taken these three main parties of west bengal elections so you can see most of the things they were flouted next please now i come to the aspect of politicizing the pandemic <clears throat> firstly uh, you know over the vaccination even during the campaigning period uh, political parties and leaders promised free vaccines if brought to power uh, bjp's bihar manifesto and campaign in bengal they kept saying this thing. in tamil nadu the chief minister palani swami made similar promise Mamta Banerjee announced free vaccination to 18 and above if elected, and there was a lot of controversy, as you are aware, about the picture of the Prime Minister on the vaccine certificate, which I don't think was removed. It is still there because when I took a printout of my vaccination, it is still there. The second thing was the controversial remarks over the efficacy of vaccine, which was you know uh, also discussed. by various parties especially in up i think there were a lot of remarks made about opposition parties made claim to slam the vaccine approval prior to elections akilesh yadav said co vaccine is a bjp vaccine another politician from up claimed that the vaccine may cause impotence bjp made inaccurate claims that compared india favorably with us and uk in terms of vaccine efficacy and cost effectiveness so uh, the election frenzy overtook the health emergency which the nation was facing and party leaders gloated over massive turnouts at the rallies i don't have to take names you people are aware of whom i am referring to the ec continued to hold multi phase polls despite requests for clubbing them together parties held huge rallies while the election commission gave warnings that were in vain which were not followed they did not take any strict measures now coming to the role of the election commission uh holding elections at a time when the threat from the virus had not abated was not questioned and was construed as the eci's constitutional responsibility instead of course it is a constitutional responsibility and there is no denying that but i don't think there was any debate whether they should be postponed or not elections in west bengal over eight phases and its break up over different constituencies were alleged as giving an unfair advantage to the bjp in the media reports if they were to be believed some stated that it, these phases were worked out in relation to the program of the public rallies that were to be addressed by the prime minister and the home minister in west bengal and therefore eight phases were there because if you recall the last west bengal election they were held in seven phases this time they increased it to eight eci was not able to restrict the election rallies and road shows from becoming spectacles in the violation of covid norms it was perceived as partisan i mean the election commission was perceived as part regulations of the electoral space through the mcc remained abnormal what i mean by that is that uh the opposition parties uh, complained that you know uh, certain people are being let off with violations while the others are being ticked off by the election commission so inadequate and partisan response from the eci is a pressing issue and even though the courts took cognizance of the same it was too little and too late for any course correction so if you see on the uh, just a minute please go back if you see the uh, observations on the right hand side uh, the madras high court in april 26 when somebody filed a pil in this regard they gave very strong strictures 
of course uh, when they said you should be put up on murder charges probably to the election commission that was not uh, really a part of uh, the judgment it was a general observation made by the judge but it was going a bit overboard i think uh, it was not called for and that is why the election commission of india went to the supreme court and contested this uh, observation of uh, the madras act but the fact is that uh, the election commission was found wanting in uh, having the instructions guidelines whatever you call them which they issued to be implemented by the political parties next please so uh, the question comes that when they are it, it's a body which is empowered they have a lot of uh, powers with them and they resort to expressing anguish and wringing of hands and ki bhai hum to kya kare type of uh, this thing and being unable to constrain certain star campaigners and leaders instead of taking stringent action against them had they taken stringent action against some high and mighty people maybe things would have been better the proposal for merging the last three uh, phases of election in the west bengal was a very viable one and which most of the parties and people agreed to it however it was not uh, adhered to by the the suggestion was not adhered to by the election commission and they only curtailed the period of the campaign they disallowed rallies and public meetings and nukkar sabhas from 7 pm to 10 am but that was i would say too little too late now while the pandemic put a break on the normal life and politics but the electoral process continued almost seamlessly at the cost of risking lives of the poll staff voters and of course the political leaders themselves as we saw later on certain uh, political people who uh, took part in the elections uh, had to succumb to covid and in its own covid guidelines cited for increased expenditure the number of polling stations etc they were defied as i mentioned earlier also by the prime minister and the home minister themselves so if the election commission issues guidelines and they are not implemented uh, this is highly unacceptable if you see on the right side there was a citizen commission on elections uh, of which the chairperson was justice uh, loku and uh, just yeah, mr uh, wajahat uh, by vibulla was also one of the members uh, <clears throat> they said this is a damning indictment of the autonomy of the election commission of india and uh, they pointed out a number of issues in this uh, report they expressed grave doubts about the fairness of the election commission of india the autonomy of the election commission of india and they pointed out that a uh, lot of people were excluded like the migrants uh, the street people people with disability the transgenders and such like people were uh, not given an opportunity to uh, be able to poll in the uh, elections next please so now uh, coming to the case of postponement of elections now as you are all aware elections are to be held within 6 months prior to the end of the term whether it is of the parliament or the state assembly elections and postponement by the election commission uh, can be taken uh, can can happen only when there are some extraordinary circumstances section 153 uh, uh, of the rpa uh, uh, states that once the notification for election has been issued uh, election commission can postpone election provided it does not stretch more than 6 months however in an emergency it can be postponed for 12 months and uh, up to 6 months after the emergency is lifted so exceptional circumstances are what as stated they are like natural calamities or law and order situations 
or unforeseen circumstances beyond the election commission's control so these are the type of reasons where uh, elections can be postponed so in this scenario the election commission has to inform the government of its inability to conduct elections and then the government has to decide whether to impose president rules and you know allow the elections to be uh if you see between february and august there were several countries which postponed elections due to the pandemic and uh, when the eci prepared to hold assembly elections in the state of as i mentioned earlier 9.9 crore population almost double that of south korea the number of confirmed covid cases in that state were 135000 and 688 deaths had already taken place this is as per a article in epw of may 2021 so i was seeing uh, the analysis of the international organization idea idea so they have done an analysis for the period between february 20 and july 21 for the whole world as to how many elections were held and how many elections were postponed so as per that 128 elections were held and uh, uh, elections were postponed in 78 countries and the maximum postponement of elections was in the period march to june 20 please note that that is the time when the uh, covid pandemic was in full swing but surprisingly i was seeing that uh, there was a, just a marginal drop in the uh, voter turnout it was just 2 or 3% drop in these uh, states in india where the election were next please now let's take a look at the role of the political parties now as i mentioned uh, the pm addressed uh, rallies and uh, there were no social distancing no masks home minister in west bengal as well as in assam and uh, even they themselves were not wearing masks covid protocols of course were violated by the crowds tmc rallies mamta banerjee they also routinely witnessed crowds that followed no social distancing norms and uh, <clears throat> supporters expressed on many news media videos that they were not afraid of corona in coming to tamil nadu dmk mk stalin's rallies were no different while tamil nadu was among the six states accounting for 80% of the new covid cases reported the party still held huge rallies gatherings where no covid 19 protocol followed similarly for congress the participants clustered together and ignored social distancing guidelines at rallies held where the congresses rahul gandhi and priya gandhi uh, were present in uh, assam and in kerala next please so people like uh, himant biswa sharma uh, this was a video which i also saw he said there is no need to wear masks in the context of assam covid doesn't exist today so why create unnecessary panic when it happens i will tell the people to wear masks so this type of irresponsible statements being given by such senior leaders <coughs> uh, shows uh, you know their seriousness about the whole issue mamta banerjee acknowledged the rising corona virus infection but blamed it on out of state bjp workers as if internally in west bengal there was no uh, you know <laughs> infection so in an interview to the indian express on 18th april amit shah said it was not right to link the surge to the polls is there an election in maharashtra it has 60000 cases while here in bengal it is only 4000 so just scoring brownie points over each other on a serious on a situation which is so serious is uh, i would say very very irresponsible now if you see the infographic of the economic times on the right hand side you will see that in these states where elections were held just see the spike in april 
from January till March or so, the graph is smooth and then just see the spike, how it rises. <clears throat> so I'm not saying that the entire spike in the cases was because of the election. There were other contributing factors also, which I'll mention uh, just a bit. But uh, the studies which have been carried out by various people, it indicates that the elections uh, which were held during the pandemic were to a great extent responsible for the surge. Next, please. <clears throat> so in mid-April 21, demands were raised from several corners to curb or cancel the election rallies in Bengal that were drawing huge number of people in violation of COVID-19 norms. Uh, but the political parties showed a mixed response to the call for restricting their prospective campaigns. For example, BJP refrained from cancelling the rallies of its top leaders and decided to limit the number to 500 people in the poll. How much of this was actually done, we don't know. TMC, they reduced the number of the big rallies. Mamta Banerjee has cancelled her big rallies. As far as Congress is concerned, Rahul Gandhi decided not to address any rallies in Bengal. And CPIM was the first to announce cancellation of all their public rallies. Next, please. <coughs> so, as you see in these uh, media pictures, you know, firstly, the cases have risen faster in the second wave. If you see the graph on the top right hand corner, the first wave is shown in blue, and the second wave is shown in this violet. <clears throat> or purple color. <clears throat> you can see how sharply it rises in the numbers of this. And uh, even the WHO and various other organizations, uh, health experts and election related people, they also commented that uh, there was a surge after the elections. You know, like in Bengal, there was just 3% positivity rate before the campaign, and it was 31% after the elections. So what was the impact, basically? The impact was that Indian lives were put at risk. Access to the vaccination was made conditional to the vote casting. There was a surge in the cases. There was partisan decision-making by the election commission. And a mockery was made of a health emergency by the political parties. Next, please. So coming to the summary of my observations, firstly, the deployment of unhedged constitutional powers without political influence is important for eliciting the trust in the electoral process and to restore the electoral integrity. All political parties and their leaders violated COVID-19 norms. Even those who are heading the Ministry of Home Affairs, central and the state governments responsible for the implementation of the DMA. This doesn't augur well for the integrity of India's democracy and the interest of its citizenry. From playing politics over vaccination to defying COVID-19 protocols at rallies, star campaigners and party leaders made a mockery of the health emergency. While digital campaigning gained a little bit of precedence, but physical campaigning continued unabated until most, most, much was already lost in the second wave. But it is not known whether the ECI approached the government to discuss the feasibility of postponement of the state assembly elections till the pandemic situation improved. The raging pandemic provided a pretty strong humanitarian case for delaying the conduct of elections where it might bring about immediate threats <clears throat> to the life, the human life and security. After all, electoral dem democracy is what? It is a political system which is valued for greater well-being of the citizens. Holding elections when they might jeopardize lives would therefore be counterintuitive use of institutions designed to facilitate individual and collective preservation. Therefore, the next slide means what is to be done. So our recommendation is that the central government should take the initiative to strengthen the hands of the EC 
in terms of the ability to conduct fair and impartial elections it is also necessary for the commission on its part to fully utilize the powers already vested in it by law this is the recommendation of the citizens commission for election headed by justice lokur and uh, even ours because uh, election commission has these powers but somehow i would say uh, they are hesitant in using these powers especially against the powerful two main national political parties bjp and congress now while the ec needs to assert its powers it must ensure that it is not selective in its treatment of the political parties hence the ec needs to be manned by suitable commissioners who are unbiased apolitical and non partisan adr has filed a petition challenging the constitutional validity of the current practice by the government in appointment of members of the election commission and that is crucial here adr pil seeks directions from the supreme court for constituting a neutral and independent collegium and selection committee for the appointment on the lines of the law commission 253 reports recommendations powers of the ec in discharging its constitutional role are very wide while the mcc that is the model code of conduct has no statutory backing it has acquired supplementary legality stringent implementation of the mcc would go a long way in placing the election commission beyond suspicion let me say with great emphasis it is not the job of the commission to control pandemics agencies such as the ministry of home affairs ministry of health and family welfare and the ndma must be questioned for their failure to manage this situation while the courts may come down heavily on the election commission they refrain from commenting on the role of the political parties and questioning their conduct during the elections most importantly the welfare of the citizens is government's responsibility however the ministers of the government themselves flouted covid-19 protocols so the only way to fix the responsibilities by asking the right questions but as we all know uh, memory is short once the event is over we forget about it. with that i end my uh, talk here and uh, thank you very much for your patience here thank you so much sir uh so wonderful and so uh, eruditely you have presented and uh, very very uh, i mean we learned a lot from your uh, presentation and from your lecture so i would now invite um, dr niranjan sahu senior fellow at observer research foundation to make his remarks so over to you yeah uh, thank you simi and uh, uh, thank you arjun uh, for inviting again and uh, uh, this was uh, <clears throat> so much of uh, actually learning uh, Uh, from uh, major general's uh, presentation i think quite comprehensive he has taken a almost i would say 360 degree kind of you know <coughs> uh, overview in just 30 minutes uh, i would not like to repeat uh, many things she said but i think uh, the recommendation that he gave uh, uh, is actually very vital in, in fact if you we have to learn uh, something you know from this uh, kind of you know experience uh, i would say very 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 uh, uh, bitter experience that we had especially the assembly elections uh, uh, this should not go waste i think uh, i think uh, just uh, uh, before this i would like to give a kind of you know perspective to this uh, entire covid uh, 19 uh, uh, pandemic and uh, and and the uh, especially the elections uh, uh, you know just to theorize it uh, a bit uh, i mean regular and periodic elections are actually you know the uh, fulcrum of you know a democratic uh, system without election you know in regular and in in, in sort of a particular period uh, then it becomes actually democratic system becomes irrelevant in many ways so so in that sense uh, this pandemic was a huge is 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 continuing to be a major challenge especially to uh, conduct regular and periodic elections uh, 
Uh, second aspect about is uh, how do you ensure political participation, political activities, and you know many things actually when you have a health emergency and the infection is spreading and you know everybody is actually sitting and there is social distancing and many things. So that's another key challenge which is also very vital to democracy, political participations and political participation during you know especially the pandemic and when you conduct elections. How do you ensure that because uh, the general uh, issue uh, with uh, you know uh, any kind of pandemic uh, uh, which is a major pandemic uh, and you have all kind of you know, restrictions is that uh, the uh, i mean uh, if you go by the uh, kind of you know uh, logic that it will have a direct impact on uh, uh, the voter turnout uh, because the people fear for their life or the thing and they would not you know like many of them would be reluctant to come and you know uh, in person especially to the uh, both and, uh, and and exercise their rights. So that actually is a kind of assumption which uh, was test has been tested during this you know one and a half years. And uh, the third aspect is about how do you actually co conduct mass rallies, you know, uh, communicate your political ideas and you know sort of campaign and uh, do the normal sort of uh, ele electoral activities uh, during that pandemic. So that's also was put in uh, you know kind of you know some kind of trial actually. Uh, but if you look at actually, I think uh, overall the uh, I think it's quite impressive. If you look at number of countries in in the last one and a half years have uh, able to conduct elections, I think with uh, following uh, stringent you know protocols and uh, guidelines, I think uh, numbers of countries doing it uh, very well. Actually, uh, you can say uh, they can outnumber number of countries that have failed. Like you know, India is I would categorize in in the failure category because of uh, sheer kind of you know number of deaths and you know number of uh, uh, damage that uh, i mean in terms of you know spreading uh, become election becoming a super spreader event so if you look at uh, i think number of countries have done phenomenally starting with south korea and you know many other countries which have actually in almost all part of even in african countries have done done it very well and much more professionally rigorously than what india has done the second, the, uh, the largest uh, democracy with a powerful election commission uh, so globally, if you look at, I think there are a lot of positive trends and a lot of countries have learned actually. In fact, if you look at uh, the last year uh, US uh, poll, uh, in fact, uh, US uh, elect, they, 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 the election commission and, you know, the uh, provincial uh, commissions actually learned a lot actually from, you know, uh, by close interaction with the CDC, you know, their uh, uh, disease control organizations. And, and they develop the protocol and many cases they try to impose uh, that very rigorously. So this actually brings about the role of election commission. Now coming down to India, I think that is where I think uh, what uh, General uh, Bauma has actually uh, uh, you know, explained. Uh, I think in India, uh, if you look at, uh, especially the, I would say the second, uh, uh, you know, the segment of election, uh, five uh, assembly state uh, ele elections, I think the, the manner in which the entire uh, elections were conducted, starting with the electoral bodies to the uh, political parties, uh, the executive branch, and you know many other agencies involved. I think uh, uh, the entire thing has been taken in a very cavalier, you know, very very sort of uh, you know just like we are conducting election in a normal time. I think that sense of you know that we are still in the middle of a pandemic and uh, and uh, you need to take uh, all kind of you know emergency measures and you know all kind of strict uh, uh, sort of guidelines everything has to be followed with you know rigors has been actually completely you know thrown into the dustbin and that is where we have seen the results actually where in a state like Uttar Pradesh uh, we had more than thousand deaths for panchayat elections. I mean, in nowhere in the world, you name any democracy, this kind of numbers you won't find actually. I mean, that shows also that uh, the low premium that we have put on human lives, you know, if you look at it. And election is probably the electoral victory is more important than, you know, the human life. That that's shows actually the typical attitude that we have. And, uh, and that is also reflected across board in many other aspects in, in terms of, you know, counting deaths and, you know, reporting uh, those, those things. You know, this has all been done uh, very unprofessionally and and entire thing has been, you know, politicized in, in a manner. Now, uh, as I said uh, I, here, a uh, uh, couple of reflections, basically, I would uh, like to basically add on what uh, uh, General Bauma said. I think uh, the principal, uh, agency to ensure that you know election is conducted uh, 
safely and you know and fairly uh, in a manner that you know it satisfies all the stakeholders uh, it falls with election commission and election commission fortunately we have a body which is actually uh, you know autonomous and independent and under article 343 uh, 24 it enjoys you know a lot of plenary power uh, so in a sense uh, election commission the way it actually cut sorry face during you know the especially west bengal you know election towards the last i think it shows a very poor leadership of, of that uh, you know kind of body which uh, has such a high reputation over several decades uh, in a sense i think this this uh, straight away brings to the issue of uh, you know they have lot of power plenary power they have they they could have drawn lot of powers even using disaster management act epidemic act which you know allows them because uh, you have uh, you know model code of conduct which allows also uh, election commission enormous power it almost takes over that you know entire state in fact uh, entire district administration comes under you know chief electoral officers you know control both uh, you know running uh, and uh, superintendents of you know that entire district administration is under uh, election commission say so if you, if election commission cannot actually uh, curb you know kind of you know violation of you know electoral rallies and you know uh, the kind of you know covid protocols all that uh, with despite all these powers which it means that election commission uh, is uh, either sighing away from you know exercising its independent power or it is, it is under political pressure so it, it's very clearly uh, that the election commission has actually uh, shown very poor leadership and in in many way that would actually cast a shadow over its you know kind of uh, image and integrity in time to come Se second thing i would say uh, is is about uh, uh, the role of you know other institutions you look at uh, i mean uh, political parties uh, i mean they are the vital institution in democracy uh, and uh, and polit among political parties both opposition and ruling party i think uh, the manner in which they 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 uh, they have actually you know uh, played their role in especially this five uh, state assembly elections is absolutely shocking if you, if you look at actually uh, if you just look at uh, uh, globally actually is starting from south korea united states other thing even republican democrats they are fighting like you know cat and mouse you know everything but at least on covid protocol and many thing even donald trump was not violating when he was speaking you know in uh, you know town hall speech and in many other thing even he was forced to follow the rules actually uh, I, i mean wearing mask and you know uh, maintaining social distancing and you know number of uh, gathering and all that was put uh, kind of restrictions why the same thing uh, couldn't, couldn't have been observed by the political party starting with the ruling party to set an example it's unfortunate that we have shown a very poor example to the world being the largest democracy and all political parties you know you name none of them you know some of them have done it for the just for the camera and you know for the press like uh, what trinamool did actually towards the end saying that you know uh, entire process can be merged into three phases and you know they stopped also campaigning towards the uh, you know last two phases i think all that would uh, it's just a drop in the oceans from the day one i think if they would have adhered i think they would have set an example for others so the third thing i think is also role of, uh, never forget about the role of judiciary which is very you know complicated and ambivalent you know like madras uh, high court and some of them might have given you know a lot of uh, sort of uh, you know sound bites for the press and other thing but on the whole if you look at the way judiciary acted in uttar pradesh is actually uh, more you know the entire panchayat election uh, was supposed to be postponed it was actually uh, the uh, high court uh, you know the, that uh, along with the high court pushed it actually and it gave the state actually a kind of you know a deadline you know that they have to conduct the election by this and this month even when you know the pandemic was peaking in many states actually so it, it is judiciary also uh, in ma majorly flawed also here uh, uh, in certain cases and and judiciary especially you know uh, postponing election other thing uh, has no business it is purely the business of the election commission you know whether to uh, postpone a elections or even you know in many way to delay uh, in several cases or even club the you know the different phases like uh, west bengal it would have been solely election commission decisions but judiciary uh, messing over it and in many way trying to uh, you know uh, uh, act as a sort of a body that uh, is is a kind of way of uh, democracy i think in many way messed up so uttar pradesh we saw the disaster actually uh, to a great extent i think it's also a judicial uh, you know role cannot be simply ignored
And finally, I think uh, uh, one thing from this, you know, in terms of lesson, I think uh, uh, General uh, Verma has uh, mentioned several, uh, you know, interesting lessons, I think, uh, recommendations, uh, yeah. One thing I would say, if the election commission, which enjoys still, you know, a lot of credibility and uh, as a body, which, uh, you know, should actually not uh, just uh, forget uh, the lessons that from the, especially during the second wave, the election, the manner in which it conducted the elections, you know, despite the surge and, you know, and the manner in which it failed, you know, to uh, prevail over the political parties and, you know, conduct, uh, you know, check those rallies and, you know, mass contacts. Uh, adding to the you know uh, super uh, you know the spread of the uh, infections i think they must institute a kind of you know a sort of uh, uh, a sort of uh, inquiry uh, or or a sort of uh, proper forensic analysis of where they went wrong and how they can you know salvage you know whatever reputation they have lost i think they should not have, you know a, 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 from this disaster i think they should learn a lesson and for future because we simply don't know how long this pandemic will you know continue and in future also you can pandemics are also going to be there so in a sense this these are going to be part and parcel of democratic process so election commission should not actually waste this you know this opportunity to learn a lesson and how to better you know prepare for the next uh, similar kind of event uh, thank you Thank you, sir. Very, very valid points you have raised. Uh, now, I would like to invite um, Mr. Srinivas Alavili. He is uh, representing Janagraha, sir, uh, from uh, from Bengaluru. Sir, over to you. Thank you. Um, hope are you able to hear me, Dr. Simi? Yes, sir. Clear. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Impri, for organizing this important session. Uh, I've uh, always admired the work of ADR, one of the a strong... Um, civil society organizations, uh, institutions we have in India for many, many years uh, that is still uh, holding up the uh, you know, mirror to the political parties and to the system with their consistent efforts. And it's a, it's a pleasure and honor to uh, listen to uh, Major General Anil Verma and participate in this conversation. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I've had the experience of uh, working with political parties uh, years ago and uh, observe the process of elections and election rallies and uh, what political parties do uh, during elections and so on. So I'll be speaking from that experience uh, more than my current uh, role as part of the urban, uh, governance and citizen participation at Janagraha. And I will bring in some points from that too. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, in terms of the topic of discussion today, I think that uh, politicizing the pandemic in, in India, we have this, uh, really a uh, you know, strange way of thinking that politicizing automatically has a negative thing. It's about bias and all that. I, for one, think that we should really politicize the pandemic. We should politicize a lot of things in this country and pandemic certainly must be politicized. But my definition of politicizing is uh, bringing out what that means and 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 politics uh, public health is all about politics right there, there is there is no uh, voter in india until now that has voted on the basis of education or, or public health or things that really matter the political parties have successfully um, if i can use the strong word hijacked the electoral system in such a way that the narratives are built on something that is not related to the outcomes that citizens of India really want. So they are very good at that and they've manipulated the entire situation to be like that. So even when in the middle of the pandemic, they continued the same process. It should not surprise us at all that this is how the political parties have handled the system. Uh, before I go more into the political parties and my opinion on, on their way of looking at pandemic, I must say that the election commission has really fallen in the eyes of uh, those of us that are looking for you know, better governance, accountability, and all of that. Not many decades ago, not many years ago, we have seen uh, an individual, Mr. T.N. Session, when he was election commission, and, and Major General Anil Verma was referring to this, right? Asserting election commission should assert their uh, you know, um, powers during the time of elections. Election commission, extraordinary powers. Today, they have extraordinary powers. They don't need, uh, uh, I may slightly disagree with the, uh, uh, um, uh, General Verma on the on the aspect of the central government need to em further empower EC. I think there must be uh, many situations where they need further empowerment, but they're already empowered. Almost everything comes under the direct control of election commission. They they have no uh, you know um, if they are really interested in in holding the elections with the model code of conduct. 
they have all the resources they have all the powers the entire machinery of the government comes directly under their uh, uh, control during the period of the election we all know that right so therefore what are they doing with it? and how many such things have happened we have recently uh, seen cases of uh, how an election commissioner himself had to uh, resign uh, because he had a dissenting opinion and so so we the, the institute of institution of election commission has really a lot of uh, soul searching to do and i completely agree with uh, major general that uh, you know the the membership of the election commission is the most important thing for us to protect uh, when a democracy and a thriving democracy like india world's largest democracy we proudly claim in every available forum if it doesn't have an independent a political unbiased election commission that works for uh, you know uh, you know thrive for for making our electoral democracy thrive and ensure that not a single vote is uh, wasted and and uh, you know the 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 norms of the election the model code of conduct and how free and fair election is conducted uh, with a you know level playing field for all political parties our democracy is at a serious threat and this is this is a, a statement that is made often so often that it no longer makes an impact but in events like this we must really think again about that the role of the election commission the maintain in all the way from the beginning of the maintenance of voter rolls to uh, actual conduct on the polling day and all of that so it is completely uh, broken in many many ways and the pandemic is just the latest edition of of uh, uh, you know the the shortcomings of the election commission that we have and when the election commission becomes yet another institute that's you know uh, that is in the hands of the people uh, uh, the people in the power then we are at a serious risk the, the number of uh, phases in west bengal is mind boggling we haven't uh, discussed that much today but i think just that one act of of splitting the election into eight phases and as per many opinions and uh, you know educated uh, uh, guesses that these things are done to favor a particular political party or other is unpardonable uh in the event in during the pandemic so we must really introspect and think about the, the role of the election commission and the kind of uh, decisions they are making the calendars they are producing and and when the civil society uh comes together and raises these issues i think there is at least some sense of uh, uh fear and wanting to do the right thing in the upcoming uh, people that lead the election commission so i really hope that conversations like this will raise the seriousness of this matter if election commission of india is not uh, unimpeachable we are in a serious uh, you know risk to our our own very existence as a, a electoral democracy and this is the single biggest uh, lesson that we must learn out of this pandemic handling of uh, election commission in my humble opinion when it comes to political parties a lot of uh, um you know uh, my the previous speakers have talked uh, about the rallies that they conduct and all that for see, my my understanding is that the political parties are very happy to distract and make make conversation about things that don't really matter so they have created a situation at this point and and people of india voters of india are also partly responsible for this but what they have done really is to conduct elections into some kind of a race elections are like ipl elections are like a tennis match you know it's like who wins it's a, a there are deep rooted problems and i am uh, uh too smaller person to get into that in front of this uh uh you know uh, accomplished panel but the first past the post system is the single biggest problem that we have as long as we have that kind of election you are going to see the political parties do every little dirty trick in the book to get that one extra vote to really uh, win that election because the the objective of the political parties has really become to seize political power at any cost and they are not going to stop at any level because the cost of losing election is too high as we can see in in uh, today's world so therefore it is uh, for the matter of survival and existence they are going to do everything that they can do why do they do rallies why why are there so many thousands of people in the rallies do people that go to the rally vote for the party or the leader that is speaking in the rally do they even listen to what is being said in the rally do uh, do they have loyalty to the people that have brought them there are they going to go back and tell everybody what they heard in that particular rally the answer to most of these questions is no because we know that these rallies are not actually about what is being said but they are merely a show of strength because the the, the idea of uh, election in indian voters mind is i am not you know the average voter is is trained or conditioned i must say politically conditioned 
to think that i must vote for the party or the person who is winning rather than who do i want to vote so this is a very strange situation that has been created where everybody is trying to see who is going to win okay so that's the winning horse so let me bet on that winning horse so it is almost farcical that the the political parties play this game of who is winning who is losing and and the media and everybody gets into that you hardly see any discussion of the merits and demerits of the candidates it doesn't matter indira gandhi famously said if i put a lamp post it will win on my name right same thing the current prime minister can probably say that and probably you won't say it publicly uh, you know uh, today but that is true a lot of people owe their very existence the getting of the party ticket itself is seen as a biggest victory or a, a, a you know accomplishment so what happens after that somebody else will take it so when we make elections hyper local it is about the consciency it's about the people it's about the candidates then we have go, we are going to get better outcomes from our elections even in the first pass of both systems but what we have seen in the last 10 to 15 years is that centralization of elections you know as if we have a, a you know direct pm election or a direct cm election our constitution does not have that but today our our entire election process is about that most people probably don't even know that they are going to vote for an mp who is going to vote for a pm or an mla who is going to vote for cm they are voting for the cm and the pm in their mind okay because i want that person to be a cm or a pm here i need to vote for this particular symbol so that is the degree of electoral um, wisdom or you know uh, intelligence that we have in the average voter and i am not talking about the people that are you know uh, really engaged and involved in that i am talking about the larger majority of the people that are voters of india most of the people in india and many studies have, have been done that how much time do people think on politics in their lives right so those of us on this panel and the people that are watching this and participating we have deep interest in politics and development and governance and things like that. but an average citizen of the world spends less than 1% of her time thinking about governance and politics because they are trying to lead their lives and they don't care to bother what's happening which is the party what are they doing this is not something that they have so they have been politically conditioned to think in a certain way and that is hurting our electoral democracy there is no outrage from the public for example at least i haven't seen it why are you holding this elections right now why can't you let the a wave pass or, or things like that i've rarely seen anything like that because they don't think it is their uh, right to question or even demand such a thing okay they said something somebody else of mutha banerji said something uh, you know amit shah said something else but what are you saying that is rarely ever seen we we don't see the voice of public expressed in a collective manner it does come out as we seen in some nationwide protests and all but when it comes to elections and politics It's taken for granted. The, the state where I live in currently, Karnataka, there's a huge talk about change of the chief minister. Imminent that our chief minister is going to be replaced with another person as chief minister. So, what is the narrative in the media in the last few days? Is the new minister, new chief minister, going to be from the same caste as the outgoing chief minister? If it and who, who are the potential chief minister candidates? Which caste does he belong to? Is that caste? what bank going to be adding to the existing what bank of the current ruling party or not so every day this is what we see in the media and everybody is tuned into that and nobody is asking the question okay changing the chief minister is happening i have no say in that somebody else is doing that who are the other chief minister candidates potential candidate what is their background what is their resume what have they done who is better suited to lead this one of the largest states of india a progressive states of india with a great econ booming economy who are the right people that can take it forward i am sorry to say i don't see such discussions even in the media whether it is on social media or mainstream media the discussion is always about who is in whose camp and how much you know what's that they can bring in and what will happen if this person is put in so we have reached a situation where the topic of governance is not a topic of elections it doesn't matter really elections are really uh, something else it's a sport it just comes and goes and people are also used to the fact that before elections their life will be in a such certain way after election the life will be in certain uh, you know the same way maybe one or two small things will change so that's also understood so how will you you lose an opportunity like pandemic the pandemic is a brilliant opportunity 
for opposition political parties, for example, to bring out the gaps in the public health care system. Public health system in India is dismal and the responsibility for that lies with all political parties, not just the current party in the union government or any regional party in a state government, but entire political party spectrum should take ownership of that. That is why I think they don't talk about it because they all have dirt in their hands. And they are, more importantly and more scarily, they don't know how to fix it. They really don't want to think about how do I fix it now? It is like, wait till the calamity happens and then I'll fix it. Look what happened in, in the wave one. We didn't have PPEs and masks. So by the wave two came, we fixed that problem. PPEs and masks are there. Somebody has recently made a statement, we are now exporting. Wave two came, now we don't have oxygen, we don't have beds, we have people dying. So many terrible things have happened in phase two. Now we are going to increase the capacity of oxygen. So this is how we, we are making policy. When really bad things happen, you put one band-aid on it or you fix that problem. Another thing happens, now you're going to fix that. When are we actually going to bring systemic reforms that are going to change how fundamentally things work? When are we going to create confidence in the people of India that that government school next to their house, near their house, or the local public health, uh, you know, primary health care center, the PHC, is the place that you should go and you, and you will get a quality service there. And how do you make that happen? We have so many missions, National Rural Health Mission, we have uh, Aishman, we have so many schemes that are announced and executed in different way, Aurogyashri, to give insurance and all of that. But where is the thinking in terms of creating the public health care system? That is not there. And this could have been the main narrative of the elections. Two parties would have argued with each other how they are going to prepare the state better for the phase three. And you should vote for us because we are going to do this, this, and this so that we can minimize deaths and, and you know reduce the impact of corona on our state. Nobody says that. What do they say? They say, we'll give vaccination free. And somebody will say, how can you give vaccination free? You can't do that. So again, it's a debate on topics that really don't. And now everybody's forgotten about. I just saw in news of the Delhi High Court or somebody said that if somebody made a statement, I think it was Kejriwal that made a statement that if uh, somebody cannot, uh, you cannot pay rent, the government will pay rent for you. So the court has asked, are you doing it? Because you made a statement, so we're going to hold you accountable for that. And I'm really curious to know what the court is going to, what's going to happen in this case, because if this actually goes through, I think we can imagine the impact of consequences of this, because the number of lies that the statements that are made are utter lies and shameless uh, you know, things that are said during the course of elections, all forgotten at the time. We've trained everybody. And, and if, if let's say if I ask somebody in media why, you know that it doesn't really matter. So it's no longer important to write about it or discuss about it. So we are, you know, it's like um, normalizing an abnormal behavior. That is what is happening with us. And what we saw in the pandemic is really uh, an exaggerated case of that. Our elections, their system is, is broken in many, many ways. And therefore, this is a, a big, um, you know, uh, wake up call for all of us to look at our political system. Elections are just a, a small slice of the overall political system, but they are the ones that dictate who comes in and who goes. I think the citizens of India also have a lot to um, you know, uh, learn from this. And the more the media and uh, you know, the responsible citizens of India, the organizations that uh, try to create awareness, uh, work in a way that instead of giving up on the fundamentals, and like ADR, keep talking to people about criminalization of politics and, you know, all kinds of things that, that you know, they're, they're the last bastion in a way, in the sense that even that is no longer impacting people. 42% of uh, the latest uh, council of ministers have criminal record. Nobody bats an eyelid. Life goes on. So I think I've said too much already. Thank you so much uh, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Very interesting and uh, important points uh, you have raised. And in fact, there are a few um, complimentary questions also to which you have already uh, responded to. Uh, so now with uh, Major General's uh, permission, sir, would you like to respond to what uh, Niranjan sir and Srinivas sir had to say or do you want to go straight to the question and answers? No, they have both made uh, very relevant points. Uh, we can go to the question-answer session. 
Sure, sure. So before uh, launching the Q&A from the audience, I have uh, a few uh, points and also uh, subsequent questions to make. So uh, you spoke about the neutrality of the EC members and also um, the, the committee should be uh, very good and you know in the selection of uh, the members, etc. Uh, where do you so see the role of women? We have just had one woman as the uh, chief election commissioner. And do you think it would make a difference uh, even both in the selection committee as well as in the, in the uh, highest uh, echelons of this authority? Uh, also, so uh, there. What is the role of state election commissions? Um, you know, the, are they just um, uh, are they just for administrative convenience, or could they have been uh, uh, incorporated to give the ground level um, evidence, the local evidence that things are not going well in terms of the health crisis uh, in in uh, in these states during this time. Also about uh, um, Bihar elections, just taking a little bit backwards, um, we, uh, the election commission held it very uh, nicely and you know there was not a, a massive upsurge and devastation like this time. So was it a collective overconfidence from all the agencies that you have mentioned that we'll go, we'll do it perfectly well uh, because uh, taking, taking the uh, uh, example from the Bihar elections. So, and also about lockdown, uh, could, um, could Mamta Banerjee not have imposed a state lockdown because it was in a mess? And uh, what, what was the reason that she was not, she did not, uh, she did not impose it? Uh, and also about uh, Mr. Sunil Aroda be, being given the uh, governorship after his term, uh, does it reflect further an intensified politicization of the pandemic? Uh, yeah, if you could take these questions, sir. Okay, thank you, Dr. Simi. So, uh, about the women in uh, the election commission, I am all for gender justice and uh, gender equality. Uh, certainly, why not? Uh, I have no issues with it. But the larger question was that uh, so far we have seen that by and large the election commissioners have been functioning pretty well. It is only the last couple of years that we've seen, uh, I would say, deterioration in the performance. And that is why, uh, and not only in the election commission, I would say in certain other constitutional bodies also, uh, where uh, selected people are placed, you know, who have a particular sort of an alignment, which is known to people. So that is the system which needs to be avoided. That is what I was referring to. Second, you have mentioned the role of the State Election Commission. Uh, I suppose you are referring to the CEOs of the states. There is a difference between the SEC, the State Election Commissioner, and the CEO. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you are referring to the CEO. CEOs, yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. See, they could have played a more proactive role, but then again, they function under the overall directions of the Election Commission of India from Delhi. So on their own, uh, yes, they could have uh, taken more stringent measures because after all, like we know, this election commission has tremendous powers under Article 324 of the constitution. They can do a lot. And this was mentioned by someone in passing and it is also one of the questions I was seeing. There is one anonymous questioner who's given seven questions, not given a name. Uh, what I want to say is that one of the ex-CECs in one of our discussions, this question was asked to him, that when you have so many powers already, why, do, and why have I given in my recommendation that you know the central government needs to give more uh, powers to these CECs? Because he said, firstly, uh, if we use our powers under the Article 324, they are like the Brahmastra which can be used once only, you know, for some very, very serious thing. He says, we can't use it every now and then. That is one. Second, he said that, uh, now what I'm coming to is powers. We are talking about the EC. They have powers to register political parties. And that is why we have close to 3000 political parties in our countries, which is ridiculous. But they don't have powers to derecognize the political parties. If you are aware, this recent hearing which has taken place in Supreme Court about two, three days back, 
wherein uh, there is one guy who had filed a PIL for uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, the political parties not submitting details as directed by the Supreme Court or reasons for selection of candidates with criminal cases. It was a contempt petition filed by somebody in the court. And uh, the court is now, they have reserved the judgment, but they are taking it seriously this time. Though uh, in the media, you must have said that as one of the judges has said that, what do we do? I mean, that is a ridiculous type of a stand being taken by these people who can change things. So they have to be more, you know, proactive and strong in this. Uh, Bihar, uh, yes, since I would say that was the first election conducted during the pandemic. Uh, yes, there were a lot of details looked into and uh, it was carried out fairly better. But in February, March, as you are all aware, the government declared victory over pandemic. publicly told they clapped themselves that we won. So that is why everybody was relaxed. Nobody was prepared for the second wave as we are not prepared for the third wave which comes now. So that is why the uh, show as far as the current or late last five election was poor from all aspects. Lockdown, yes, the chief ministers have a lot of powers. And uh, if somebody strongly feels that uh, this health emergency takes precedence over conduct of elections, they should do it but yes they have to take the central government into uh, confidence but the point is which political party does not want to have elections you tell me one in india we uh Srinivas has covered it very adequately i think so i won't go into more uh i will not talk about uh, mr sunil aroda less said the better Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much uh, for those responses. I would now uh, read out a few questions. Uh, so this uh, question is that, uh, uh, this, um, for example, uh, what, what about the fact the constitution itself does not provide for political parties? It is possible, is it possible to envisage a system which only elects individuals without parties, political parties, at all, something like board of directors who then elect the prime minister, some hypothetical question. My um, quick response is uh, that uh, it is wishful thinking. <laughs> this cannot happen. The way current things are in our country, I feel even independents have no business to be contesting elections. They are just for the money. When there is a, you know, uh, tight contest, so that is all that they do. So there's no point having independent candidates. What to talk of independent, you know, everybody is, uh, oh, that is very difficult. It's not practical for a country like us. So the question about media, how much is the res media responsible for all of this? We never see any conversations happening on topics that matter in politics in the media, whether it's too I don't think we should uh, sort of blame the media for any of this. Uh, there are, of course, uh, we have seen certain, uh, you know, channels without naming them. They consider themselves to be the national and nation's voice and all that. But we know how they are aligned and how they speak. But at the same time, during the election, I have seen that there are a lot of media houses who do very good footwork actual grassroots reporting. They conduct chopals, they talk to citizens, they are giving you the ground reality from people. So let's not sort of, you know, paint everybody in the same brush. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are the good part and the bad part, uh, but media, I think during election does a fairly good job. Mm -hmm. um, Only thing which we have to watch out nowadays is social media. There's too much of fakery in that. Yes. <laughs> Right, right, sir. So, sir, I would invite uh, Ms. Swati, she's a researcher at IMPRI, to present her question to you. Swati, over to you. I have thank read you the so question. much, sir. Yes, she has another one. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much to all the panelists and the speaker for the beautiful, really insightful uh, session. Um, so my question is that the pandemic has been a big threat to humanity and to the established world order. 
or quickly transforming fragile democracies into autocracies in the name of public safety. So how India will perform and how India being such a large and well-established democracy would respond to the crisis has been a, something that has been looked upon by all the governments and we actually failed in that context. So the, and the autonomy of the independent institutions like the election commission is now being questioned as we saw that how uh, we took measures during the pandemic, the protocols and everything. So now whom shall we as the people, as the citizens of India blame, the, uh, the government or uh, the supposedly independent institutions that are the basic pillars of our democracy? Okay, you want me to answer that? Yes, sir, if you can. Yeah, okay. So as I had mentioned during my presentation also, as per me, the basic fault lies with the political parties and the government. You see, like somebody, that anonymous uh, questioner has asked a relevant point. He says, uh, who's to blame then? Voters to aake vote karte hain. Kyun aate hain? How will you stop the voters? You, are, you know the polit politicians can incite, the, incite their supporters to do anything. You are seeing what is happening in Bengal or otherwise. So uh, if the political parties take no responsibility, they are not accountable to anybody. What do you do? They consider themselves above the law. What do you do? When I'm telling you that the Supreme Court judge said, we have been saying this, Amari koi sunta nahi. This is the state. We, uh, 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 the ADR got a judgment from the uh, uh, C, uh, what do you call this, information commission that all the political parties should come under the RTI. No political party is following that. So they just disregard what they don't want to do. And they all come together for these type of things. So uh, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, it's a question of questions have to be asked by the public, the society. Now, another question of that anonymous this thing was, what is the civil society doing? civil society is it is the public, the people have to come out and ask questions from their politicians. Na? I haven't seen the face of my MP or the MLA where I live in Gurgaon. He's never come. So the other question was about this participative democracy. You know, somebody is, I have read all the questions. It means interaction between the public, the voters and the uh, politicians, which doesn't happen. Once they take the votes, after that it is Tata bye bye. You don't see them. So we have to bring about this change of participated democracy. And the only thing a politician fears is losing the elections. So the public has to make him understand that you will lose if you don't do A, B, C, D. That is my view. Right, sir. Thank just, you so much. Uh, can I add just to what? Uh, uh, Major General said, uh, uh, see, entire thing, I, I think, uh, is basically in our, uh, uh, I mean, democratic system, entire thing is actually, it begins and ends with the election. We do not have democracy in between the elections, you know, that major, you know, those, those five years is actually where the democracy should be really played out. You know, the, what uh, Major General said about the people interacting with their, you know, representative. That doesn't happen, actually. It, it, it is, you know, that deliberative part of, you know, democracy. We are basically an electoral democracy and nothing beyond it, actually. And in, it, it happens only in, maybe in few states. Maybe you can cite the example of Kerala or, you know, few states where, you know, the literacy rate is very high and citizens are very active and alert. And you have also a strong civil society, you know, movement. Uh, there is a legacy factor also which pushes them. To in many way. Otherwise, if you uh, look at the entire uh, Hindi heartland, you look at the eastern uh, zone, you know, central India, many part of it, it's basically, you know, it, it's just like a festival uh, happens every five years. And once, uh, you know, people are given uh, all kind of freebies, you know, uh, and then they, they feel happy, uh, caste, communities, religion, everything is played out uh, like a true festival. And once that is done, uh, they don't give a damn actually. And, uh, and, and that's the reason why uh, uh, the political parties, whether it's a ruling political party or even opposition party, they behave so arrogantly and so, I mean, uh, I mean, 
in a, in a sense actually you simply uh, feel helpless actually uh, ruling party of course they have all the levers of power but look at even opposition party i mean can you approach many many mps or mls uh, they, they are unapproachable in many ways actually and uh, uh, the most important thing is actually you look at accountability where do we have the mechanism to fix accountability you look at the state of our institution what uh, major general said and what srinivas also said is about look at the state of judiciary today forget about the election commission judiciary today is uh, showing its helplessness as, as if they don't have power they have power if they want they can they in previous uh, decades they have put uh, chief, chief, chief secretaries many senior politicians on the a yeah, and you know have uh, demanded accountability why can't they do it today so there is obviously there is something you know institutional culture the culture of complicity or you know in many way actually many things have actually converged to produce the kind of most hopeless you know situation that we today see about democracy where you know average person feels helpless and many of the institutions which were you know doing a stellar job all your decades today they fear you can easily see it what's happening to the press actually today you can easily see what's happening to many of the independent institutions today I mean, I mean, so the climate of you know that uh, entire democratic climate has actually gone through a kind of you know a different day in last few years, and 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 that has a chilling effect actually on every institutions. Same election commission, you know, General Roma would actually even say in just four five years back how how much assertive and how uh, what kind of way with all the you know the, the always there will be accusation and blames on certain aspects of you know election or other thing. But election commission was doing a stellar job in many cases. Today it's not doing actually. Yeah, Dr. Simi, may press, I come in? Yes, sir. Uh, just okay. to interrupt, they had a press briefing when Tejasvi Yadav had said that you know the certificates are not being given to the winners. So they made it uh, at twelve, around twelve uh, at midnight. So they are assertive at times. Yes, Shrinivasar, <laughs> over to you. If you can quickly yeah. present your point. No, then... Yeah, I'll I'll keep it brief. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity. So um, the the aspect of participatory democracy is is beaten to death. Right, we talked about it a lot, and uh, in fact, uh, I think participatory democracy is is alive and thriving in India, judging by the number of people that come on the streets for. CAA or form loss or things like that. We see that all the time. And uh, at Janagraha's end in the cities where we where we focus on, we see a lot of uh, citizens coming together to you know fix their streets and the footpaths and the lake and you know there's a lot of volunteering that happens. This is also participation in democracy. What we don't have is a a formal institutional sustainable models of. participatory democracy it is some years back many of you remember when jairam ramesh as a minister did the uh, hearings on the uh, gm uh, for you know uh, foods there was there was no standing room in those halls and people had so many opinions and they come in so whenever those kind of forums are created there is public input coming in and all the angst and the opinion on the social media will actually spill into the real life and on the ground also so at janagraha what we try to do because we believe that the participatory democracy is is best uh, uh, you know achieved at a local government level to begin with as we create a more aware citizens active citizens that want to participate in the uh, city governance that's how they get into the model of working with them and we have programs like participatory budgeting right so the cities uh, the citizens of bengaluru for example give inputs to our city corporation called the bbmp on what they want to see in the next year's budget we collect all that input analyze it remove the duplicates and remove things that cannot be done and then create a system where those inputs can actually make sense to the municipal corporation their engineers their finance department and convert it into line items in what needs to be done in the budget so the institutional mechanisms for participation in cities already exist through the 74th amendment and the community participation law and all of that that's called ward committees we have ward committees in india gauhati in the case of pandemic handling many cities have created citizen committees at the ward level why did they do that because they figured out that the decentralized way of governance makes most sense to handle the pandemic so now if that process continues for managing the streets for managing the mosquitoes during the dengue season and and urban flooding that is participatory democracy too and that is a participatory governance that people can actually experience and see the impact of it so i i would like to uh, ask the panelists to think more about this and the organizers and think of how 
participatory governance can begin at this level. We have the Gram Sabhas in, in, in the Panchayat level, and we have the ward committees in the cities. So finally, uh, using this opportunity, I'm going to appeal to uh, Major General Vama that ADR should start tracking the municipal elections, start tracking the candidates that stand for the municipal elections. We haven't done that. We somehow haven't given importance to the people that are the closest elected representatives. Somebody said the MLA hasn't seen me, MP hasn't seen me. Has the councillor seen you? Because more than the MLA and MP, the municipal councillor, the corporator should be street should be saying hello to you you should be able to reaching out to her is that happening and that's where gender balance can be achieved too because nearly 50 percent of municipal councillors are today women so there's a lot of women in governance we are not leveraging that we are not strengthening that system when we do that a lot of good things will happen because all the research shows that when women are in elected positions there are better outcomes for everybody and that is irrefutable evidence from the panchayat for many years from many states across india same thing can be done in cities and that's how we can strengthen our political system from the grassroots to the next levels is my opinion thank you thank you sir thank you very much so you have uh, perhaps given um, some recommendations for the way forward but we'll come back to you uh, so now i would move to the way forward round and uh, i would invite dr niranjan sahu if you could uh, for 2 minutes each each of the panelists could take and then reflect on what are your recommendations policy recommendations if you have uh, yeah uh, uh, thank you i i think uh, uh, i mean uh, 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 i said uh, some of those things during my uh, comments. Uh, see, pri primarily, I think, uh, I mean, both uh, Major General and Srinivas, they have actually very well articulated, you know, one articulated about the entire macro problem, you know, starting with uh, the leadership, uh, political parties, election commission, and, you know, several other institutions. And then Srinivas very well added about the the third tier, you know, institutions, local government, you know, in, in, in fact, I would, I, would, I would jump to, you know, add saying that, you know, the, 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 this is where we have actually missed the boss actually for last 75 years, you know, by not uh, really paying, you know, attention to the third tier government, because your democracy really begins at your ward level, at your panchayat level, at your gram sabha level. We have been, we, uh, what we have actually democracy is basically a sort of a kind of, you know, architect, institutional architecture, a kind of, you know, structure in which, you know, MP, MLAs are elected and sent to parliament or, you know, assemblies and they represent. But just imagine in, if you really you want to have a, because within even in indirect democracy, we have a mechanism to have direct democracy through third tier, you know, institutions where representative uh, and uh, the citizens will have you know opportunity to interact and you know in many ways that would actually uh, lead to a lot of you know policies at the upper level that's not happening you know our democracy has remained basically lok sabha and assembly level and and all other things that we have done is basically ritual five years kind of you know rituals and then institutions you know uh, like uh, what we have today are actually facing the onslaught of the executive you, you, when you have i mean this is not just to blame the executive today executive and any point of time which had you know enjoys full political majority had also uh, tried to boss over the institutions uh, exert pressure and you know it, it, it was done during the congress time uh, even 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 uh, uh, this was the case also with uh, uh, nehru's period i mean one of the most democratic prime minister very liberal prime minister also never hesitated to you know use uh, uh, the executive power to uh, pressure the institutions like uh, you look at the first amendment uh, look at uh, several other you know constitutional uh, amendments that happened during uh, nehru's period because that was the time when executive was enjoying you know absolute majority it can do any you know boss over and you know just uh, do anything and in the this period it reached the pinnacle and we have seen the other side of it now, now we are facing a sort of a, a BJP onslaught, uh, which enjoys, you know, BJP of uh, a Bajpayee's time when you had a coalition government was a diff had a different character altogether. But when you have the same party, uh, uh, which has enjoys majority, it changes the year. So I'm saying uh, there we have to actually really think in terms of check and balance. What check and balance can be put? And that cannot be just exerted by, you know, this just a handful of institutions like, you know, judiciary or media. I think the a lot of these things have to actually be with the citizens themselves. 
the citizens do not actually become a real stakeholders in the democratic process what i'm talking about democratic process you know not about elections you know it is between the elections you know if they don't make their representative accountable and responsible and answerable to them and if we continue elect you know people who are history sitter criminals and you know people with all dubious credentials and well the candidates uh, you know many of them are you know ea mafia mining mafia and all kind of things they are just basically here actually to get elected and you know uh, do uh, they are bidding in in the parliament and assembly for uh, different uh, kind of you know uh, policy influence so so in a sense we have to actually ask this hard question and i think the fundamental aspect is that we have to pay more attention to the third tier institutions strengthen the panchayat bodies strengthen the you know uh, municipal bodies and there we must assert and if we can actually tighten our control there i think it will have a effect actually at the lok sabha as well as assembly level and so i am saying it should begin uh, 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 you know uh, 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 from a very very you know kind of i would say At at a uh, level, you know, uh, at, at the level which is very much closer to our, you know, day-to-day -day life, actually, and that is where I, I think uh, we must assert. If we don't do, we'll be all the time, you know, finding fault in some institutions and some MP and other thing, and uh, nothing would happen. Actually. Right, right. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, Shrinivasan, if you have any, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I, uh, Dr. Rajan covered the local government aspect, so I'll skip that, and I really appreciate that he made the point. on local government uh, the only thing i will add is ward committees that's a, that should become like a buzzword that all of us should be talking more about and and support in terms of uh, going forward next steps for election commission i think election commission should take a very uh, stringent view about uh, poll code violations in terms of uh, using caste and religion in election speeches and dividing people and they should uh, not hesitate to disqualify candidates i think those are the kind of things that can actually uh, teach the candidates or the party leaders a lesson without disqualifying from the elections they'll keep doing that so the moment you 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 start doing things like this at least the, there'll be some fear that this is anti constitutional and i should not be doing this in an election rally they should be, make really serious uh, you know attempt to uh, do this uh, and uh, the other point um, is really about uh, you know whether uh, the the people the what they are doing during elections and in between elections right so we need to uh, the reason that happens is that the mps and mlas today are pretty much powerless they don't really have a role to play in terms of legislation they don't have a legislative role anymore they are just warm bodies they are human count to give majority why is that happening and the root cause for that is the party whip we have unfortunately due to the anti defection law we have created this whip system which has completely ruined the role of legislators in this country it's about time that we demand the civil society demands all political parties to remove the party whip and empower our own legislators we have excellent mlas and mps in all parties all over india and they're all reduced to dummies and just repeat what their party wants to say who gets the chance to speak up in the lok sabha and the vidhan sabha is completely broken our parliamentary democracy is is hindered by this whip system and when that goes away you will see strong voices coming out and you see the accountability of the mlas and mps today they will have to run around ministers to get things done when as the legislators they can bring up your a uh, conscience is issues in the corresponding house which is their fundamental duty then they'll stop acting like super corporators or municipal councillors and worrying about water and and uh, you know uh, garbage and actually worry about the policy at a state and the union level that's what needs to happen thank you thank you sir thank you so much now i would now invite uh, major general verma to make his concluding points and so if you could make present your policy recommendations and also ways for electoral reforms if possible okay. uh, dr sumit thank you uh, most of the points have been covered by shrinivas and dr narendran uh, but i have already given the recommendation as far as this subject of today is concerned otherwise electoral and political reforms is a very vast subject and you know uh, it would be a sort of going stepping out of the domain today to talk about those things i would say as far as the today's subject is concerned one is human life and human dignity has to be uh, seen very seriously by the government as far as the election commission is concerned it has to strictly 
uh, implement the MCC and if they have issued some guidelines, whether it is for the pandemic or whatever, they have to ensure that they are followed. They have a lot of powers, so they have to ensure that. And uh, third important thing is the accountability of the political parties. Now, how to achieve that? That can be done only by the people when they, you know, do it uh, with the interaction with the politicians who come to them and by uh, the judiciary. So the judiciary has to come out of this mode of pussy putting and, you know, we kya kare, kaise kare, ye wo. they have to assert themselves and they are capable of passing certain strictures. Uh, for example, if any one of the party's election symbol was frozen for not implementing this thing, they would have been held to pay. But they don't take such mag. They, they are empowered to do this, but they will not do it because uh, I had given the reason earlier. And the third important thing is, I said, the appointment of the right people, apolitical, non-partisan people who are selected by a group of eminent citizens who are including it in the body selecting the thing and not only the government officials who sit down and appoint people. I think, uh, and coming to the point of Srinivas, what he raised about the MC, see, uh, we, ADR does not have the wherewithal to do the... Uh, you know, this thing of all the municipal corporations. We, we do uh, in part sometimes, but it requires too much effort because the numbers are huge and we don't have the wherewithal to do it. So that is why we are not uh, actively engaged. In it. And uh, so with that, I think uh, I would end. You know, I've already given my main recommendation in the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It was so enriching. Thank you. Now I would invite uh, Ms. Anshula Mehta, Senior Assistant Director at IMPRI to propose the fi uh, formal vote of thanks. Anshula, over to you. Um, thank you. And uh, I would like to formally thank everyone for joining us on behalf of the IMPRI Center for Human Dignity and Development. Um, I sincerely thank our speaker, uh, Major General Anil Varma, sir, for taking out the time to be with us today and for delivering this uh, lecture on politicizing the pandemic impact on electoral democracy. Uh, it was indeed a, a very enlightening and thought provoking uh, session. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I am also grateful to our discussants, Dr. Niranjan Sahu and Srinivas Alavindi for joining us and sharing their insights and enriching the deliberation. Thank you. Thank you also to Dr. Simi Mehta for moderating the session and to the entire IMPRI team for bringing this event to fruition. And of course, thank you to all our viewers who joined us here on Zoom or on Facebook Live and raised such pertinent questions. And we are grateful if you are watching later on YouTube or listening on our podcast. So thank you once again to everyone and I wish you a good evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Arjun. Thank you, sir. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sumit. Thank you. Thank you, sir.